Meet Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar, a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10-pound weight on this end, and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one-fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns, but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never-ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift in our motor car. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh and keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear, which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So in low speed, we get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission.
after we've started the car rolling, we want fast pickup. So we shift into second by sliding the sleeve backward to mesh with this gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute, and the power flows through these gears. For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The power travels straight from the engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. We now have three sets of spinning levers for going forward and one for reverse. With a gear shift lever, we can shift to any set of gears we wish. But with all these spinning levers in the transmission came noise and wear. Experts could shift gears quietly by careful timing of the gear shift and the engine speeds, but most of us made plenty of noise until new engineering developments made possible a long series of improvements that followed. When we shifted gears, we got a clash because the gears were not running at the same speed. In other words, not synchronized. So engineers set to work to develop a synchronizer. The synchronizer works like a cork twisted into the top of a bottle. The cork will turn until it is so tight that the bottle turns with it. Synchro mesh works the same way. When we shift into second or high, the synchronizer brings the gears to the same speed before they come together. The drums won't let the gears shift unless they are turning at the same speed. When the gears come together, there is no clash, and the shift is made quietly and easily. In the transmission of the up-to-date automobile, we have a powerful low gear to give us a strong spinning leverage in starting. A fast-turning motor must set the weight of the car in motion. In second speed, we can change leverage to get going fast at the same engine speed. With the leverage of third gear, power goes directly to the rear wheels, and we can go as fast as we want. Now every driver can shift gears at any time, regardless of speed. Here is a hill that will give us a real chance to see how smoothly and reliably our spinning levers work in our automobile transmission. This driver is going to let her car gain a speed of 60 miles an hour down the hill. Then she will shift into second speed and bring her car easily and safely under control before it reaches the bottom of the hill. If you've ever taken a flopper in a pool, you know it feels like hitting something hard. Every good diver knows you must hit the water right or it won't get out of your way. You must make your dive so as to cut the resistance. Just as a fish moves around without noticing the ocean, we live near the bottom of a great ocean of air. 
And although a hundred times thinner than water, air has a force in motion that is enormous. Air offers a lot of resistance to anything going through it. However, nature makes it possible for birds to fly through the air at speeds that seem out of proportion to the size of their muscles. Science has found that this bird's speed is a matter of shape as well as strength. The streamlines of birds make a little power go a long way. With this in mind, engineers study the resistance air offers to moving shapes. Since the earliest study of streamlines, wind tunnels have been used to find out what happens when an object goes through the air. A wind tunnel is simply a long tube with a fan or powerful blower at one end. A stream of air is blown through the tunnel at varying speeds. In some tunnels, up to 120 miles per hour. Small models are placed in the wind stream and the action of the air currents is observed. Whirls and eddies in the air currents around the models are studied. And the amount of resistance or drag is measured by sensitive instruments. In order to obtain a permanent record of resistance offered by various shapes, liquid is used instead of air. And its action recorded by a motion picture camera. The paddle wheel powered by a motor draws the liquid through the center passage and sends it around the outer passages. Slots are used to eliminate whirls at the turns and create an area of even flow. An object is placed in the liquid. Aluminum dust is added so that we can see clearly what happens to the current. Any form cuts through the liquid as it would through air. This shape is not streamlined. As the liquid strikes the front or leading edge, pressure is built up which causes resistance. Then, as it rolls off the rear, it is thrown into spins or eddies which create a suction behind the body. Regardless of shape, some resistance is unavoidable. As the liquid goes by the shape, its direction of flow is changed, and this change of direction wastes power. By rounding off the corners, this change of direction is made more gradual, so the amount of effort is decreased and resistance is cut down. Making the shape longer and thinner tends to cut down resistance. This decreases the violence of the eddies and reduces the suction in the rear. With an even thinner shape, the liquid flows more easily and there are fewer eddies at the rear. A streamlined shape with blunt nose and tapering rear eases a hole with the least resistance and brings the liquid together at the rear with the least disturbance. The ideal streamline follows a strict geometric design which engineers call the parabola. The length should be just about three times the greatest width. Such streamlining makes it easier for an object to get through the air by reducing wind resistance. The higher the speed, the more it helps. Any automobile traveling through the air meets the problem of wind resistance. So engineers set about applying the principles of streamlining to the automobile. And by rounding the contours and tapering the rear have smoothed out the flow of air around the body of the modern motor car and smoothed out eddies at the rear. Of course, to a bird, cars today might seem already well streamlined. But as seen by a worm, the modern motor car is anything but streamlined. Yet the bottom of a motor car represents about 20% of the surface and sets up considerable wind resistance. The development of more complete streamlining for motor cars will be the problem of engineers of tomorrow. Someday, this problem will finally be solved. Sometime in the future, the completely streamlined torpedo car may come into use. Elevated highways, wide and level, may let us go 120 miles an hour. But such a torpedo car on our streets today would be entirely impractical. However, practical streamlining has been applied with success to the finest motor cars today, with many additional advantages. 
The streamlines of the new turret top give greater strength to the body of the car than the old box-like construction of yesterday. The slanting windshields and windows cut down glare from rear and sides and make safer driving. Streamlined fenders enclose the wheels more completely and help to keep the car clean. And they protect the wheels from force of strong winds, making the steering easier. Sloping rear panels allow for more tire and luggage space. These modern streamlines round out all details and absorb them into a good design with new beauty and dignity of appearance. This practical streamlining brings to the new automobile increased comfort, quiet, convenience, safety and beauty. Practical streamlining brings a modern motor car into step with modern airspeed styling, which has real economy and efficiency.